Hi, I'm Daniel Wordsworth. For more than 30 years, I've experienced war zones, natural disasters, refugee camps, and sprawling slums. Now I'm going to show you a better and more optimistic world. This podcast is Finding Good. Another episode of Finding Good, and for those of you that are following along with this new season that have been listening in a linear fashion, then uh, we might move out of Colombia and the the wearing of uh, double pairs of underwear in in the event you get kidnapped from the last episode (laughs) and and maybe bring it back to Australia this time. Mm -hmm. Daniel, hello and welcome back. Good, good to be here. Yeah, th- I think the double underwear strategy is not a sound one. No, right? you got- <laughs> <laughs> I mean, in prepar- just on that, in preparation for potentially being kidnapped every day, if you were that sort of person and wanted to move through life with anything could happen, double underwearing is not a bad idea. Yeah, yeah, but uh, hopefully that's not for most people. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, actually, what I want to talk about today is what I think of as the most underrated force on the planet. Yeah. Yep, and I want to shine a light on this. And I, and I, in an earlier episode, I also sort of talked around this issue when I was talking about like who's going to save us. Yep, and and I think sometimes we have this idea that um, it's like tennis in a way. We sort of see it like watching Wimbledon that there's a group of like sort of evil conspiratorial bad guys doing bad things on one end of the tennis court and on the other end there are the super geniuses, good people, the saints, the brainiacs, you know, the people that have come up with the technical solutions and these sort of 1% powerful people and that we are in the audience and that the world will be determined by the interaction of those two great forces. And what I tried to say in the earlier episode is actually those um, those people don't really exist, actually our only saviour is really going to be ourselves, mm. yep, that we have to look to everyday people. Yep. You know, when I tell people that, they often look very disappointed, yep. <laughs> like, you <laughs> no. mean I'm the answer, <laughs> right? Like I was hoping there's some like super brainiac that's coming up and... and uh, yeah, they were really hoping for Tom Cruise Mission Impossible right, yeah. to come in and Surely there's a all. Tom Cruise. Yeah. Yeah, and there's not, yep. And that often when there is a Tom Cruise, uh, he's just waiting for lunch, yeah. right? He's got his own <laughs> things and he's just got his own things doing his own thing, right? So it's about us. So what's the most underrated force on the planet? It is the idealism, compassion, and the drive of everyday people to do good. Yep. And I have seen it over and over and over over again. I said on another episode, I'm always the bronze medal winner when it comes to helping, right? I have gone into some of the most difficult, most dangerous places on earth to do good and to help, and I'm never even close to being the first person there. There are always people engaged in doing good. So, but how do I know if I'm doing good? Often when we sit and we see the things that are going on in the world, we say, well, look, it's just me, right? You you look in the mirror, you go, it's just me. Yeah. And then you think, what could I possibly do? You see a conflict in the Ukraine. You see a famine going on in the Horn of Africa. You see an earthquake or some dreadful thing happening. You you see homelessness in Australia. You you, you see these large issues and they seem overwhelming and you think, what can I possibly do? What can I do by myself? And the answer is you can do nothing by yourself, but you're not by yourself. Yeah, you might be independent, but you're you're with a larger group. There's always other people that are all working together to do yeah. this, and that you can actually assume it. Actually, that's why I'm in World Vision. Well, I was about to say the first, my earliest memory of this growing up in Australia in the in the early '80s was the 40-hour famine, right? right? So mm-hmm. you, your organisation, World Vision, created the 40-hour famine, yeah. and that was the charity thing that we all did. Yeah. And we we, we yeah. did it independently. We'd get our friends in. We'd all have a summer party and everyone get a big bag of barley mm-hmm. sugar and some videos yeah. and everyone would sit around and watch Revenge of the Nerds mm-hmm. and maybe the TV show, the live concerts that they used to put on and see the neighbours' stars and suck on barley sugar and know you were doing good by raising money for helping these kids who at that stage were in, in I mean, Ethiopia was the the, right. the, the big... Um, you know, everything was in the marketing and you felt like you were doing something good. Yeah. Yeah, I think in many ways World Vision taught uh, most of Australians how to give, right? And that's back in that sort of uh, your your youth, right? Your mm-hmm. high school doing this kind of experience. But, you know, one way to think about World Vision, like I've lived away from Australia for 25 years and I was in the places that we've talked about on the podcast. I've come back here specifically to work um, with World Vision and there's a reason why, Yeah. So, well, Vision, people may not realize it, but it's a it's a it's an organization that spans the globe. It's the largest charity on earth. Is it really? Yeah. Yeah, it really is, yeah. And so then you go, well, why is that important? So I think about it a different way. So a, a charity is like a nonprofit, right? And mm-hmm. and a charity gets created when a group of everyday people say, you know what, we don't like the way the world is for uh, homeless people. We don't like the way the world is for our kids, right? So um, we're gonna come together, we're gonna create an organization and we're gonna do something good about it. And that's called a nonprofit. Mm-hmm. It's just everyday people. It's just a vehicle for doing it. Yep. And the biggest one of those in the world, 
There's world vision. And you know what? So, and so when I think about that, I think, you know, it's not, it's the, the way I think about it is it's the largest force for good driven by everyday people on the planet. But I go a step further because if you're the biggest today, you're the biggest forever, right? So I, I, I say we're the largest force for good driven by everyday people that's ever existed in human history. And, and, they, and you say, well, what do you mean driven by everyday people? We're in 100 countries, and in those countries we have boards of directors, right, governors, people that are run World Vision. Like in Australia we have it. We have uh, our board here. These are all regular people. We don't have – there's no heads of state. There's no Bill Gates. There's no, there's no movie stars. But there's 10 dentists, right? <laughs> there's a bunch of teachers. Like when you go into the countries and you look at the – who runs World Vision, the world's largest charity? Dentists, some lawyers, some teachers. Everyday people. Everyday people run it. I love that so much because you would not think it. You would not for a second think that the world's largest charity is run by this. Now, you, people might say, well, what about the UN? The UN is a government entity. It's ama- we need it. It's amazing. But it's not run by everyday people. Yep. And so um, that's the role we play. And in Australia, World Vision has this special place because so many, me included, so many of us learned about a broader world through the 40-hour famine, through sponsoring a child. So many people I meet, they say, the first job I got, I also did this. First paycheck I got when I was in that little home looking after those six kids that were abused, my first paycheck, I sponsored a child. Right. Yep. And uh, so many people, when, when their first child is born, they sponsor a child because they want, as their child grows yeah. up, they want to have that sort of teaching moment. Yeah, we did it. Yeah, yeah. So it, it, and this the photo is sits on the fridge, and, and the kids write the letters. And so there are like things like the barley sugar, the photo on the fridge. These are like part of Australian culture, and it's a really beautiful part. And uh, you know, it's Kylie Minogue and Jason. It was the forty-hour famine on Home and Away. Well, vision in so many ways is a reflection of the idealism of the Australian people and it's beautiful. And that's our job, right? Our job is to simply reflect and empower the idealism of Australians to do it. You know what the other thing I love? Because like, World Vision is also the largest um, international charity in Australia mm-hmm. by far. But you know what's amazing is that we got largely built by 14-year-olds. Yeah. And by... Out of the 40-hour family. Out of the 40-hour family. And the singing budgie. Kylie is... The godmother of World Vision, make no mistake. Wow. And um, She would love to hear that. Yeah, she is. Yep. Here's an example. We mobilised in the last 10 years $3 billion from everyday Australians to do good in the world. Yep. And that was built by 14 and 15-year-olds. They built the biggest charity in this country and also Aussie mums, right, because most of the sponsored kids, they get done by Aussie mums. Aussie mums built World Vision and I love it. We are the perfect representation of that. And now you see us in the retail shops. You see we, we just belong to this country. But we are also proof that if you allow everyday people to, a chance, they'll step up and do good. You know, when we think about philanthropists, we think of Bill Gates and we think of Jeff Bezos and we think in our country, Twiggy um, Forrest. Forrest and... Uh, all these, fa- all these the guy fancy from Atlassian. guys. Yeah, that fancy guys. Yeah. Right? Or the <laughs> Paul Ramsey. Guys. Whatever these ones are. I get told, don't say that. But I mean, you know, these ones are we all go, oh, whatever. Everyday people give more than they give. Do they really? Yes. In Australia, giving has been driven by everyday people more than these rich people. Now, I, again, are these rich people doing great things? They are actually. Right? They're doing what they're meant to do. They do amazing things. They really do. And I'm not, I'm not in any way denigrating that. But I'm just saying they're the bronze medal winners to the everyday person. Now, speaking of everyday people who are doing good things and giving, you've brought someone to the show today who has done just that. So Alana Nichols and her husband Josh have been building a a growing purpose-led business in Australia for the last 20 years. It's called the One Co Foundation. Uh, If you want to be involved, and hopefully you will be by the end of this chat, onecofoundation.org is the website. Alana is joining us now on Finding Good. Alana, tell us a little bit about your organisation. Yeah, so OneCo is an organisation uh, that is all about uniting small to medium businesses across the globe who believe in profit for purpose um, and uniting our efforts, um, collective impact that will transform lives across the globe. Yeah, so, and, and Alana, it's sort of, you have a kind of unusual thing, right? Because you're connected to a business uh, that, you, that you and your husband own, right? How does that all work? Yeah, so we, uh, we've been in business for 22 years. We started very young at 19 and 22. 
And uh, we had a business that started just as a single man in a van. My husband was an electrician um, and it grew very quickly. Uh, and so we started to actually expand our brand across Australia. And when we started to grow in franchising, uh, we wanted to embed a culture of generosity and giving into our business. And so we came up with simple ideas um, to actually unite everyone around purpose together. And uh, it was a simple idea, one van, one child. We connected with World Vision. And for every electrical van we had on the road, we sponsored a child um, and it just took off. And so we had over 200 children sponsored. As our business grow, grew, so did our charitable impact. Um, and it's been phenomenal. So you have this, so the idea was you create this electric business, electrician business, as you bring on electricians with their own vans, they kind of like, they can franchise with you, they can be any part of Australia, but then they sponsor a child. So they have a way of giving back as they're doing their work. Correct. And what we found is that for us personally, as business owners, my husband and I, we really feel that our purpose in life is the more that we can make in business, the more we can give. And we wanted to um, create something that a whole bunch of other business owners could be a part of as well. And we found there's a lot of people that are in small to medium business that have a heart to give, but just, you know, you're wearing so many hats when you're in business. And sometimes, you know, to give back and to help is really important and valuable for business owners, but it often doesn't come to the urgent quadrant that they talk about because they've got just so much going on. So we just wanted to mobilize a community of business people within our brand and to help bring that to life. Um, and everyone just loved it. Yes. Yeah, so can you tell what is a small medium business? Like what, what are the, what, who are these people? Well, they're every day, um, often mums and dads who have a family, who have children, um, that, you know, have a skill, but then they think, you know what, I'm going to go out on my own. And, you know, I think I read a stat the other day that 998 of businesses in Australia are those small to medium businesses. It's it's phenomenal. They're everyday people just, you know, doing their thing. And so they're like hairdressers and what did you say? What's this mix now? Because it started with electricians, right? So now we actually have, um, you know, created this organisation to help many businesses, whatever size, style of businesses. So we have many businesses that are a part of our amazing community. We have hairdressers, we have accountants, we have business coaches, we have plumbers, we have builders, we have people that sell baby products. Totally different business styles, but all united around this same heart that they believe in using their business for good, for, um, you know, using their profit for purpose. And the, the charity partners, is it just World Vision or are they able to uh, give to their own charities close to their heart? Yeah, so how we work is we we strategically work with partnerships with um our on the ground charity partners. So World Vision is someone that, um, you know, we've worked with for over 10 to 12 years, and now we're bringing other charities to work with. So whether it's water wells, whether it's homeless families in Australia, whether it's uh, maternity care in Uganda. So at the moment we have uh, five charity partners. We really believe our whole model is about strong, lasting, deep partnerships. And so it's not about just random relationships everywhere, but building strong relationships like we originally did for the last 12 years with World Vision. We want to do that and, and grow. So as our organisation grows, as we have thousands upon thousands of businesses coming, we will add more charity partners, but we will do it with wisdom and intentional partnerships. And do you go out and, and find the small medium enterprises to be a part of this or do you find they're coming to you? No, they're coming to us. We have um, an amazing community. We have this um, slogan within our organisation called Who's Your One? Who's your one business this year that you can encourage that wants to embed giving culture and um, strategy and initiatives into their business? Who's your one? That is so easy for everyone to do. And we just say every year, just bring one business. So our momentum and snowball of growth will come from that. But also one of our strategic ideas is partnering with organisations who already have a network of influence and businesses and plugging and collaborating with them to go, you know what, let's bring generosity and giving alive. Because what we just keep hearing from only starting, you know, not that long ago is that there's a need for this. There's business owners that want to give, but they're just stuck. Um, but we know how to do it. We've been doing it for 12 years and it's such a joy to be able to bring this alive. We're seeing amazing impact in the communities on the ground, but we're also seeing amazing transformation happen in the lives of the business owners and their team. 
Uh, it's super exciting. So what does that look like, Alana? What do you mean by transformation in their life? Oh, it's phenomenal, Daniel. Like when I started, you know me, I'm so passionate about, I've been to so many field trips, I've visited our children, I've seen the waters, I've seen it all, I just love it. But what I found when, because I knew it was never just going to be about us, I knew it was about opening this up for other businesses. And when we started, even in our pilot stage, I would sit in a meeting with a business owner and they would just have tears in their face as they were sharing their story and we connected them to purpose. I remember one gentleman, he's selling water bottles, cycling water bottles. And I came to him, I said, you know what? I think your impact could be related to supplying water wells, but not building new ones, actually restoring water wells. There's so many water wells across the globe that sometimes just need a little bit of a tinker to repair and it brings water to a community. So I talked to him about restoration of water wells. He's there crying in our first meeting saying, Alana, my... My life story is one of restoration. My marriage fell apart. My daughter got leukemia. Over this period of time, my life has been restored. And with tears in his eyes, he's saying, now I have an opportunity to bring restoration to communities. Like this is what it means to connect, to be a part of purposeful giving that resonates with you as a business owner and your team. So, you know, other business owners, I remember in the pilot stage sitting with another um, business owner, she sells baby products and I, I came into her business, you know, when I first walked in, she was feeling overwhelmed by just the pressures of business and um, she was in baby products and I came to her and I said you know what I think a project that helps um, provide maternity care for a really remote um, community up in Uganda I think that might be a great fit. She starts to cry because um, she said you you know what last night I was I was chatting in bed with my husband just saying this is really hard business and she was reminded for some reason that she always had a heart for Uganda. She'd never visited there. She didn't really have anything to do with it. But for some reason, that was in her mind. And the next day I come in and say, I think a project with helping women with maternity care products will resonate with you, resonate with your brand, with your customers. She has a lot of followers on uh, Instagram. Anyway, she started to cry. She's like, oh my goodness. And then as I left that meeting, she had a skip in her step. She was like, I now, she, it's like it gave her courage to go through the hard times of business and, and, and say, you know what, I'm going to keep pushing through because I know as I do this, the direct um, relation that it has to helping these women in Uganda, it gave her a purpose. It gave her a why. And this was just in the pilot stage. And as I left, for me, I was like, oh my goodness. It's like I'd almost forgotten the business owners. Like I knew they wanted it, but I was so focused on the communities. But I was like, oh, my goodness, this is the best job in the world. We're bringing hope and life and transformation to the business owners. I'm like, this is a win-win for everyone. I think what what seems to resonate with me from what you're saying is that the business owners are able to align their own passion with exactly how they're able to help the community. So it aligns with their brand and aligns with their product so they can see how their contribution makes a difference. Yeah, that's definitely what it's about. Our model is very much helping businesses. A lot of businesses get involved in just sporadic random donations. You know, an organisation will come, a not-for-profit will come and say, oh, would you like to help this? Would you like to help that? And they go, yeah, okay. And it's just very random. But when you can actually connect a business owner to something that's purposeful and meaningful, you watch. And it's all about intentional generosity, not generous moments randomly, but actually creating a culture of generous people. That it's not heartstrings being pulled at, you know, at a gala event or this, but it's actually month in, month out, I'm connected to this because it connects to our purpose. And it's amazing. You watch over time the multiplication of being intentional with your giving, um, connecting it to your business and economic growth. It's, um, it's phenomenal to see. And a business owner looks back and they think, oh, my goodness, look what we've been able to give. Look at the impact we've had because we measure the impact and it's a super exciting story they're able to to be a part of and share. And so when they see that, I'm telling you, for business owners, they don't miss, they don't miss it. But when they when they make that commitment and then you just watch it unfold, it's they, they look back and they're like, oh wow. And it just gets them excited and they want to do more. So what's the goal from here? Yeah, the goal, well, Daniel's a numbers man. I know he's talking about a billion uh, hectares with FMR. He likes he likes a billion. A billion is a good word for Daniel. He uses it often. Yeah. So I'm gonna <laughs> So I'm going to match his billion. The 10-year goal is 70,000 businesses collectively giving a billion dollars towards impact. 
70,000 businesses. Now, when you hear that, by the way, you think, are there actually 70,000 businesses in Australia? So are there? I know. When my mentor first chucked a number at me and I was shocked, I'm like, oh, that's a big number. And I actually settled with it. The next day I had to Google. I'm like, how many small to medium businesses are there in Australia? And there is 2.6 million. So 70,000 is only 3%, even less than 2 point something. I'm like, we can do this. And so we see this becoming a global phenomenon. So it'll start in Australia. It'll be birthed here, but you watch as it starts to um, take off in in, um, countries all over the world. There's a lot of corporates that have CSR, corporate social responsibility plans and teams, but the small to medium don't have the time, the resources, the experience, and we're just going to unlock that for them in a super easy way. And um, together... It's all about this impact, this collective impact we can have together. By ourselves, we can only do a little bit. But together, it's like you watch. And so, um, yeah, I think it's achievable. I'm actually that comfortable now with the 70,000. I'm like, no, what's next? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's just, that's just Australia. A, 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 next, it'll be a billion businesses around the world. <laughs> that's it. Done. And, you know, I did some Googling. I don't even know if it's, you know, sometimes it's dangerous Googling. But I'm like, what does it cost to eradicate poverty? You know, I don't know how much you can trust this, but I'm like, really, when you look at it and you look at the numbers, it is so easy and achievable. There shouldn't be what we see in the world today. Mm. And it's actually not hard to fix. Mm. Like if everyone just does a little bit, Mm. and I believe I'm called to, you know, facilitate this army of business owners, but it's it's actually not that hard. When, When they look at the poverty and they look at the 30 richest countries in the world, which Australia is one of them, we're a super blessed country, it's like, it's not hard. It really isn't. Alana, what an amazing thing you're doing. You and your husband have, have created this foundation. And for anyone wanting to be involved, we will put a link to your organisation in the show notes here on the podcast and also on the socials as well. Um, congratulations. Well done. I'm sure it's not the last time we'll speak. And please feel free to come back and tell us more good news. Thanks, Fitzy. Thanks, Daniel. <laughs> Alana was a great guest to bring to the show. <laughs> she was. How, how nice to know that you can you can give yeah. while still aligning to your own business. Right. You know, the water bottle story yeah. is great. It's amazing. How did you find Alana? She supports Well Vision. And so when I came, they said, you want to meet this one called Alana? Yeah. Yeah. And well, we need to get Josh on next because <laughs> I want to hear from him as well. Yeah, he's great too. <laughs> There's this, you know, I, I've read about this a lot, this thing called compassion fatigue. Yeah. So when, you know, Alana's out there talking to businesses who are wanting to do good. Yeah. But quite often people are just sitting at home not thinking about how they can help the world and that they get an unsolicited phone call or they get an email or they get a door knock and they're like, well, I gave it the office. <laughs> you know, is this a true thing, this yeah, compassion? I, I, don't know. I, I don't know that it is, Fitz. What Alana is doing, it's based on a beautiful assumption Right, her starting assumption is that a hairdresser wants to do good in the world, that the guy making the water bottle wants to do good in the world, that the electrician, that the tradies that we see, that given a chance, want to do good, that it's not them that's the problem. Like that they they've got. She's told us right. They have, it's hard to run a small business. There's so much going on. It's hard to concentrate on that sort of stuff. But given the chance, would they step up? And what Alana does is give them the chance, and they're stepping up. By the thousands to do it. And and then yet we still talk about this idea of compassion fatigue as though, I mean, I got told when I was coming back after 25 years, I was coming back to Australia and people said, oh, Daniel, Australia's not the country that it was when you left. I said, what's wrong with it? Oh, it's much less compassionate. Australians don't care about what's going on overseas. What will you do about that? And I said, I'll do nothing about that. Well, they said, well, why will you do nothing about it? I said, I don't believe anything you're telling me. Right. Yep. I believe Australians are idealistic, compassionate, and want to give. And if they're not, that's not because of them. It's because of the message we're giving It's them. something else going yeah. on, right? And, and so then you dig and so people go, well, that's compassion fatigue, meaning they're sick of, sick of being compassionate. I go, no. They're sick of being told they need to give something give, to someone. So then I go, well, what if they are compassionate and they're, and they're not giving? Why would that be? And I think about it more as belief fatigue. What people are asking is, can I, if I join in, will it change anything? Will it, will it make a difference? Will it make a difference? So why, why are people mistrusting then of charities? I think uh, people are mistrusting of almost every institution in our society because our institutions have been failing us for how long, 20 years? Mm-hmm. That the, the, very thi- the very things that every institution is responsible for 
we feel like we're being failed at those. And so you look around in dismay and you say, who can I trust? I want, can I trust the education institutions, our political institutions, our media institutions? Who can I trust to faithfully deliver on their promise? Yep. And I think many of us have been betrayed so many times and we feel betrayed so many times that we begin questioning everything. And so we question nonprofits too for the same reason. So if they're mistrusting, how does that show up? The clearest way that shows up right, is when you talk to a person and you say, would you like to donate to help uh, kids in um, you know, Kenya or somewhere? They will say, how much of the money goes? Yeah. Right. What percentage of the money goes? That's we'll it. Let to, me see. Let me see what percentages go. And so, you know, all nonprofits have all these things on their website. 90% goes here, 80% here. But, but what I'd like to dig on here is that when we hear that, what we're hearing, we hear is mistrust. But that's not actually what's happening. That it's my deep belief that most of us want to live up to our promise. That when we look in the mirror or when we look at our kids, we want to look and see a good person. And when we look at our kids, we want our kids to look up at us and think, I got a good dad or I got a good mum." And then when we try to think, well, what's good like? And then we say, it's surely it just means that the world is a little bit better for me having been here. And that while I was on this earth, I did my part. I shouldered my burden. I acted like a good, noble, idealistic person and I helped somebody. I just want to be able to do that. And sure, I've got my family and I've got my job, and everything, but I want to be good. And I, I think we, we underrate that desire. I think it's deep desire. Well, because a lot of people would automatically assume if I have to do, if I'm doing good for someone else, I can't do good for myself. But you can help, you can help someone else while still helping yourself. Right? So the greatest realization each of us ever have is of our worth. The mystery is we only really see it when we give to another. So that it's in the giving that we see who we actually are. And when we look at ourselves, we suddenly are the version of us that we wanted to be. And it may sound mystic, it's just true. Yep. That we actually recognize and see ourselves through our acts of service to others. I don't know why the, the world is this way, but it is. Yep. And I think because I believe this is such a deep desire, I actually think our deepest desire is not for happiness. It's not for success. I believe our deepest desire is to give. Yep. And we all want to. But if you give to an organization and you find out that the organization hasn't spent the money the way they said they would, yeah. Well, they haven't spent as much of the money that they said they would. It's the most horrible thing. But that's where you feel. That's where you feel ridiculed. You feel well. I've, I, I trusted you, and I feel betrayed. And yeah. people are going to point at me and go, "Why did you give money yeah, to that?" Charity? This is why. This is why it's such a sacred betrayal. It's because you imagine in most of our life we feel like we're just living our existence, right? And then we get a chance. It's like all our life we get told, don't, don't trust this, don't do this, people are going to do this, people are going to screw you. So we, we've got all this armour on us, right? Armour of cynicism, armour of disbelief, armour of if I give this, they're going to do we, we We create this protection, this armour. And then one day we see a chance to be good and we think if I do that, it's like I'm revealing myself my idealistic self, my loving self, my soft self, if I reveal that and you betray me there, you've really hurt me, right? Because you've hurt the actual me. This is why people are afraid to be vulnerable. Yeah, it's totally. Same thing. Same thing. And the act of being, giving to a stranger, talk about vulnerability, is a, is a trust. And to have that, betrayed is so that's why most of us put this on and so and the experience that you get is shame right so the way i think you know there's the you know they do those things that what are the humans most afraid of yeah. right and so number two on the list of what humans are most afraid of is death yeah <laughs> it's not the number one the number two thing on the list is death now we all know what number one is right this is this is like a thing number one public speaking right. so you go <laughs> So humans, the seconds... Would prefer I've, to die than speak in public. Would prefer to die than speak in public. <laughs> and then you go, why is that? 
You go, because there's no shame in dying. Right? If, if, you, if you're on stage and, and you're talking in public and you, you look like an idiot, you're full of shame. What that's telling us is we fear shame more than we fear death. Yeah. And so when we're asking somebody, when somebody comes to me at World Vision and they say, I want to help kids, I want to give, I believe it, I want to trust you, believe me, and I give you the money, just tell me, you're not going to make a fool of my goodness. Hmm. Yep, you're not going to make me feel shame that I'm not, when I go home and I, I'm, I'm in a retail store and you tell me there's a child in Tanzania that if you sponsor that child, you can make their life better and you'll get to know that child and you'll watch them get better over the next 10 years. And I run home to my husband or my, or my wife and my kids and we're at the dining table and I say to them, guess what I did today? I found this child and I'm sponsoring. You don't want the, everyone to go, well, you're just an idiot and you're a fool and they don't. Yeah, that's money we could have spent. We could have done. <laughs> it's like, it, to me, it's like Jack and the Beanstalk. Right, it's like, you know, the Jack and the Beanstalk, we get Jack wrong all the time. You know, Jack and the Beanstalk, he has the cow. He take the dad says, take the cow to the market, sell the uh, cow in the market, get some money. He gets the magic beans, sells the cow for the magic beans. And he beans. sells it and someone comes around the yeah. corner, psst, do you want some magic beans? Yeah. And then we all think he's an idiot. Who wouldn't sell a cow for magic beans? <laughs> yeah. Provided the beans work. But how many times in your life have you been offered magic beans? You go, these, are you saying these are like magic beans? And they were magic beans, by the way. So it ended up being genius. But I think that feeling, that idea that sometimes you can, we have this fable and this myth that something can be too good to be true. And there are so many things in life that are too good to be true. But the one thing that's not too good to be true in life is the fact that you can be good, and that you can do good, and that you can get to the end of your life and say, the world was better off for me having been here. Yeah. And you can hand it to your child and say, keep going. Yep. That's real. We get to do that. Yeah. Yep. And Alana is a perfect example of what that looks like. Yep. Hairdressers, guy making, it's the most yeah, beautiful electricians, story. Electricians. Bakers, yeah. I love it. And sponsoring children. I mean, we, we had uh, Abraham mm. from Alight on yeah. an earlier episode in the first season and he tells that story of, of someone coming yeah. to him and just paying for him to go to university, someone he's never met. Mm. But now he runs that organisation, mm -hmm. you know, helping people in the Congo. That's, that wouldn't have happened probably had that person he knew he's never met just sponsored him yeah. essentially or, or paid for him to have that education. And that's what people can do. This is what you're talking yeah, about. Yeah, this is what I'm talking about. And I'll, I'll close with this one story. When I was in high school, I wanted to be a pilot in the Navy. So but my mum had left. I was a sing I had a, My dad was a single dad hmm. and he was working seven days a week and it was not real easy and he was just doing his thing and me and my brother were largely left to our own things. And um, I just wanted to be a pilot in the Navy. I just wanted it so bad. And every time the Navy would come to the school, you know, for their, I'd be in the front row and I'd ask them all the things to do to be a pilot. I really wanted it. And then one day, the career advisor, a guy called Tony Wormsley, teacher, he grabs me and he hands me this document. This is in year 11. And I, he said, take this home and get your father to sign it. And I said, what is it? He said, this is your application to join the Navy to be a pilot. And I said, what do you mean is my, he goes, it's due tomorrow. And I said, I didn't even know it was, uh, I didn't, <laughs> because when you join the military, you have to join in year 11, not year 12, right. right? So I didn't realize. And he goes, and I go, how did you get all this? He goes, I went through all your files in the school. I went through all the bits. I filled out all the forms. All you need to do is get your dad to sign it. So I went home and said to my dad, will you sign this? He signed it. I brought it back and I got into the Navy. It's all because Tony Wormsley, this teacher, filled out that form. And then people say to me, um, how lucky are you? And I say, luck has nothing to do with it. He's good. Hmm. I could rely on it. I was completely oblivious to his goodness. And without me even knowing it was ev evident or present, he was good nonetheless. And you can bank on that stuff, right? And Tony Wormsley is an example. And you got to be a naval pilot. I did. Were you Maverick or were you Iceman? <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> Actually, that that movie came out that year. Yeah, yeah. Oh, I was going to say, <laughs> was this driven by uh, was this driven by Top Gun? Uh, beautiful. Hey, we're going to leave it there. DanielWordsworth.com is Daniel's uh, website. You can email the show from there. You can s- please subscribe on all the uh, podcast platforms and rate the show. That's really important because it helps us be discovered and helps spread the goodness by simply rating the show and, and writing a little review. Tell us that you like it as well. Follow Daniel on all the socials. This is Finding Good, and we'll talk to you next time. 